Uh, again, this is Ryan Rayner from the National Governors Association. I want to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar of Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. In particular, I want to welcome Joe and Jackie and Tony and others at Smarter Balance and thank them for uh, agreeing to partner with us to offer this webinar. Uh, we think, uh, as I'm sure you guys all agree, it's a very critical time right now for the assessment consortia and for states as they think about implementing the Common Core and, and the assessments that are aligned to the standards. And we really uh, hope this is the first of many conversations in an effort to create a more consistent dialogue between the consortia and governor's offices as they plan around budgets and policy and putting the right supports in place uh, to make sure that these assessments go off in a timely manner and that the students receive the necessary support to actually be successful on them. Uh, this webinar, uh, this call is really intended to be a close conversation between uh, Smarter Balance executives and governor's offices. And so I know that we may have others that have joined um, the, the maybe Smarter Balance leads uh, I would just ask that, if possible, uh, you give deference to the governor's advisors that are on the call uh, today in terms of asking questions and, um, and directing specific uh, conversations to, to the Smarter Balance folks, just so that we can make sure that the governor's offices are really uh, getting their, answer, their questions answered. Uh, we are going to have uh, a fairly open agenda. Uh, Folks from Joe from Smarter is going to give uh, walk through a presentation where he's going to cover different issues, including test development, sustainability, technology readiness, policy and communications, um, and then we'll leave ample time at the end uh, for your individual questions. Uh, before I turn it over to Joe, I just want to do a, a quick roll call of the governor's offices that. RSVP'd for the call, and then uh, certainly if there's others that have joined. Um, so, Connecticut? Yep. All right, Michael is on the line. Hawaii? Tammy, are you there? All right, she will be calling in. Um, ben, it looks like you're on in Oregon. Uh, let's see, California? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Wyoming, Mary Kay, are you on? Uh, Judy in Nevada. Sounds like we may have a few that are joining late. Um, Michael Brickman in Wisconsin. Um, all right. Uh, are there other governor's folks uh, on the line that I didn't get to? Well, I see a lot of names, so um, it's possible that you guys, and, and a lot of call-in numbers without people registered, so it's possible that you're just not speaking up. So uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Joe Wilhoff, the Executive Director of Smarter Ballot, to walk through PowerPoint and then again, hopefully have at least 30 minutes um, of time available, 25, 30 minutes available for question and answer at the end. Uh, so Joe, again, thank you for, for doing this for us and, and we look forward to the presentation. Um, thanks, Ryan. Uh, also on the line is uh, Jackie King, um, who directs our higher education collaboration. Uh, Jackie will chime in from time to time. Also, is available for questions uh, as we uh, as we move through. Um, and Ryan, I'm confirming, uh, reconfirming. I think you said that the slide deck would be made available um, to folks uh, after the call. Is that correct? Yes, that's the intention. Great, Joe, uh, because also, they're this is Jackie. We're also recording the webinar, and we'll post it to the Smarter Balance site so folks can uh, access the recording as well. Great, great, because there, there's a, a, a bit of text in some of the slides, so um, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to review that um, in more detail if you need to uh, later on. So let's go to the first slide. Uh, so what we want do want to talk about, as Ryan said uh, today 
is an uh, overall look at how the system uh, it is being designed to work, um, give you a little bit of insight into the test development process and the uh, quality control procedures we're putting in place to make sure that we deliver a high quality assessment. One of the questions that we also often get, and um, actually most of the slides in this presentation have been prompted by questions that um, one or more of you have actually asked us on different occasions. Um, and so one of the questions that does come up is, how are we going to sustain this thing and how much is it going to cost? So we do have some information there. Uh, and then another topic of, of interest to almost everybody is the question of technology and uh, are our schools and districts ready to uh, administer this assessment and where do we stand with regard to that. So let's go ahead and jump off and get started. I um, want to let you know about some uh, activities writ large which are major milestones uh, with regard to the development of this assessment system. Um, in uh, just a little bit um, less than a week, uh, we kick off our pilot testing uh, for this uh, spring, which runs February through May. Actually, we start on February 20th. Um, and then uh, this will be a test of the test, not a test of students. We will take a quick look at uh, our first um, development of items and see how they're going. We have some slides later on that talk about that in a little more detail. A year from now, we have our field test. Uh, this will be the entire set of the Smarter Balanced uh, items for our item pool, about 35,000 items in the field test in the spring of 2013. Um, I'm sorry, that's a typo. That should be March through June of 14. Um, and then uh, we begin to deploy for operational use uh, the uh, full uh, assessment system beginning in the fall of 2014 uh, with the operational summative assessment in the spring of uh, 15. So let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, generally uh, what we uh, have done is, is made sure that we attend to whether or not the technology is going to work. Um, and we have a sampler available at our website, uh, smarterbalance.org. And actually, that uses what I think we could fairly call a beta system, a beta version uh, of our test delivery system. So we are already using um, an early uh, developmental uh, approach uh, to the uh, test engine, if you will, or the software that will be delivering the, uh, the assessment to students. So when I say that in the pilot we are testing the test as opposed to testing the students, again, one of the things we're looking at is whether or not the delivery system that we're using uh, makes sense for kids. Uh, something as simple as is the calculator in math items in the right place? Do students know how the calculator works? Uh, do they understand how the drop down works so you can uh, you know, make the calculator appear on the screen? Uh, do they know how highlighting works? If you're in a reading passage and you want to highlight something, do they do they see that that uh, that that is working properly? Um, the early and earlier version um, of it will be used uh, in this uh, pilot testing, and then in 2014 when we do the field test, it will be um, essentially the full blown um, assessment delivery system that we will use in 14 for our field test. So that when we go live in 14-15, uh, uh, we will have had at least three rounds of students interacting with our uh, test delivery system so that we're very confident that students know how it works, that it doesn't break when you, uh, when you log on, um, that it's uh, stable, that it's robust, and so on. Uh, next slide. Um, another um, important issue for us is to make sure that uh, what we report to you all uh, is, uh, is accurate and uh, has meaning. So we have already uh, done work with something we call achievement level descriptors. Um, achievement level descriptors are uh, text-based statements about what it means to be performing at different levels on this assessment. So that's where the achievement level part comes from. And so they describe uh, in words what it means 
uh, to be at the lowest level in mathematics, what it means to be at the next level of mathematics, what it means to be at what we refer to as level three, or that is actually uh, performing at what typically is called proficient or uh, at, at a mastery level, and then what it means to be at the highest level on our assessment. So how do you describe student work, say, in fifth grade for an advanced or very high performing uh, fifth grader? What, how, what do you, what, what, uh, what sentences do you use to describe that kind of, uh, that level of performance? This work uh, began in October and um, it uh, involved uh, K-12 folks and higher education folks. And um, we brought them together for a large convening. We sent it around for multiple uh, opportunities for review. Uh, and actually, when we come together in March, we will be asking our chiefs uh, to approve the work so far on achievement level descriptors. And we then wait for uh, the actual item uh, performance of students on these items and check it against the achievement level descriptors to see if student performance is in fact aligning with what we, uh, what we think is uh, adequate performance. Um, we are, uh, uh, over time, continuing to improve um, what we, instructions we give to item writers uh, to make sure that we clearly describe to them the kinds of test items and test tasks we're looking for on the assessment that align fully to the common core. Um, we are actually putting together a certification program for item writing and quality control processes so that as we move forward, uh, states can engage uh, and, uh, with item writing and can provide items for the Smarter Balance Assessment. We can use teachers across our states uh, to develop items and tasks. And finally, we have external reviews of our items uh, by folks uh, who are stakeholders with various uh, perspectives and interests. For example, bias and sensitivity uh, work being done by um, the folks who have uh, engagement with students with disabilities, um, also uh, English language learners, and so forth and so on, just to make sure that the quality of the items uh, is what we, what we expect uh, of a high-quality assessment system. Uh, next slide. Uh, there's, as, as you can guess, there's quite a few slides here on overall approach, and I'll pause at the end of the overall approach section to see if there are any questions. Um, we want to make sure that this system actually does work for everybody uh, engaged, for kids, uh, for policymakers, for state agencies, for teachers, and so forth and so on. So we actually have between 80 and 100 staff from our member states uh, and from higher education, from K-12 and from higher ed, um, across our membership who uh, participate in what we refer to as work groups that help design the system. Uh, we have uh, 10 focus areas of these work groups uh, that span such things as accessibility of the assessment uh, to various populations of students, um, includes a couple of groups focusing on item writing and also focusing on performance tasks. Um, we have groups that look at validity and the psychometrics, the measurement characteristics of our assessment system. We have a group focused on formative assessment, a group focused on implementing common core. As I say, there are about 10 of these work groups, and they each provide leadership and guidance to the consortium with regard to the work that we do in that sector. Um, these work groups typically guide uh, the production of contracts that we uh, seek for procurement from contractors, and they also evaluate then the bids that come into us and uh, then guide us through the negotiation process as we have, as we select a uh, vendor to provide those services for us. Then once contracts are initiated, the work groups monitor uh, the performance of that contract and make sure that we stay on track. This is not unlike what goes on in the State Department in each of your states right now with your own assessment system. Uh, you typically have folks in your state agency, uh, in your state, that review, that produce the contracts, that then review them, and then select a vendor, and then monitor the work. And what we've done is we've expanded that across our membership so that states are doing work that they're used to doing, but in a larger context, in the context of a multi-state consortium. We're getting 
Uh, in addition to that, we're getting external advice from two particular panels, a students with disabilities and an English language learner advisory panel. Those are staffed uh, with uh, national experts uh, in the field, and we meet with them frequently to make sure that the accessibility uh, of this assessment is fair and that we are producing an unbiased and reliable assessment. And finally, I uh, invite everybody to go to our website uh, at any time you'd like. I think Smarter Balance has a well-deserved reputation for being extremely transparent with regard to our work, uh, all of our policy decisions, our governance, uh, the, uh, the progress that we're doing. Um, there's almost certainly more there than you'd care to know, uh, but we feel that we have a commitment that we need to make uh, particularly with a multi-state consortium like this, that we are extremely open and transparent with regard to how we make decisions, what decisions we make, and how we move forward. Uh, next slide. Um, so we want to make sure that folks know what's going on with our costs. Um, we had a cost estimate in our original proposal uh, that we wrote back in the spring of 2010, so it's been a while. Uh, but at that point in time, our proposed costs were on the order of $26 per student. Now, that's not per test, but that's per assessed student, about $26 per student um, for both English language arts and mathematics. Again, that was, those were cost estimates that were conducted um, under contract with an independent uh, entity who uh, does this sort of work. Uh, we didn't want to look at our own navel and decide our own costs, um, but we asked uh, a, a private vendor to do that. Uh, we currently have a contract with that same vendor, Active, uh, to do cost estimates for the design that we have in place right now. So that is being updated as I speak. Uh, we anticipate that those costs uh, will come through to us uh, sometime uh, close to the end of this month or the very beginning of next month. And we do know that many states are in legislative sessions right now and considering um, uh, cost uh, features and budgets for the, uh, for the upcoming biennium. So we do want to make sure that we can get that, uh, the cost for Smarter Balance uh, into the conversation. But for right now, if you're pressed, uh, to engage with a number, um, I, I do want to share with you that roughly $26 per student uh, cost for a full cost of ownership for a state. So what a state would need to set aside in its budget would be on the order of uh, $26 per student. That turns out to be um, on the cheap side of the median cost across our member states. Um, so it's a little bit less than the typical state uh, in our consortium currently pays. Uh, that means that some of you, uh, this will be less than you're currently paying, and frankly, for some of you, it will be more than you're currently paying. Uh, if it's more than you're currently paying, we are actually probably delivering more than you're currently delivering. Uh, for example, we give a full writing assessment at every grade. Uh, not many states, if any states, currently uh, do that. Um, we are looking at uh, a final analysis of the cost such that there would be some of the cost would be dollars that flow directly to a future organization of Smarter Balanced to handle consortium-wide affairs, such as uh, validity studies for the entire consortium, um, ongoing um, item development uh, to enhance uh, the quality of the item pool. Um, the services to member states that are common across uh, member states. And then some of the total cost of ownership, the state should set aside uh, to use to pay a vendor for the delivery support of the assessment that you're giving. Things such as hosting the uh, computer system um, that, would, uh, that would support the assessment. Uh, things such as making sure that uh, the uh, data files for individual students uh, for the English test and the math test line up to the same students so that Jimmy Jones gets uh, a score for math and a score for English that is actually both belong to Jimmy Jones. These are the kind of details that occur inside state assessment programs that it's not really truly efficient for, an entire, for a single consortium point of entry to try to manage that across 20-something uh, states and about 11 million students. 
that's better handled at the state level. But there are certain things that are handled better, quite frankly, at the consortium level. Um, so we're working out these costs through what we're referring to as sustainability. Um, and uh, we are also working on efforts to facilitate joint procurement of services so that states can partner with other states, uh, either by geography or, or by size, uh, to drive their costs down. And finally, we are developing our technology um, with the notion in mind that we want to keep the costs low on technology. And so we are designing a system that can, uh, that can best be used by uh, multiple states um, across, um, a, 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 across a technology platform that is, um, uh, that's cost effective. Uh, Ryan, I think I'll pause here for a second and see if there's questions, because I've been talking quite a bit, and I know cost is a factor that is a question on people's minds. So, uh, Ryan, let me go ahead and pause. Perfect. Um, governor's folks, any uh, questions for Joe? Well, as usual, I've put folks to sleep, so that's a good thing. I, and I. Um, I'm sort of a human ambient pill, so um, we'll just go ahead and move forward, and I, I do invite people to holler at when you, when you have a question. Uh, let's see if we could jump to the next slide, please. So let's talk for a second about the pilot test. Uh, this does begin on the 20th of February, so a little less than a week from now. We have about a million students in what we call a research sample. Uh, so we have randomly selected uh, schools uh, that produce about a million students so that we can generalize from the results that we find uh, on the pilot test. Uh, this is an engagement with about 4,000 schools with another 5,000 or so uh, wanting, to, uh, wanting to engage in those 5,000 Additional schools will have uh, the opportunity to participate closer to the end of the school year, but we have about 4,000 in our research sample. Um, over 5,000 test questions are on the pilot test, um, and this will afford us the opportunity to look at different kinds of items and how they work together or how they interact. It does include performance tasks. Um, these are collections of test questions and tasks that are bounded around a common theme, if you will. Uh, so a performance task in mathematics might be something like uh, design a playground. Uh, and how would you design the playground if you want to put a merry-go-round on it that needs a certain diameter and a certain amount of space uh, for kids to jump on and jump off? And you need a rectangular area for a swing set. And uh, how are you going to do that? And what, how much, I don't know, uh, how much uh, beauty bark are you going to need uh, underneath the swing set uh, if it's going to be four inches uh, deep, and here's the area, how many cubic yards is that, and so forth and so on. Um, so that's what a performance test looks like. We are concerned that there may be students who are in school, to follow my example, who uh, maybe don't have a merry-go-round on the playground or don't know what beauty bark is or, or stuff like that. So we are looking at whether or not we shouldn't include a classroom activity before the performance tasks that kind of helps level the playing field. If we have a performance task about nuclear energy, uh, maybe we should have a little bit of time where kids and their teacher can talk about nuclear energy and just get all on the same page about what that means. We would not be giving any clues as to how to do well on the performance task. We would not be helping anybody uh, with the task, but we really would be leveling the playing field so everybody enters with at least some uh, amount of background knowledge. So we're researching classroom-based versus non-classroom-based um, uh, presentation of these performance tasks. We have constructed response items. Uh, these are items that have many, many possible incorrect uh, answers and fewer, but still many possible correct answers. Some corrected, um, I'm sorry, constructed response items can be answered uh, in such a way that they can be scored by machine. Uh, others are going to need to be what we refer to as hand scored. Uh, and the cost factors I addressed on the previous slide will include the costs necessary for the hand scoring uh, involved in Smarter Balanced. We have open-ended items. 
that uh, actually have a single correct answer but multiple incorrect answers. Uh, these are typically scored by machine. Uh, we have technology enhanced items that include drag and drops or audio responses or video responses um, that, uh, that use the computer in different ways. And then, of course, the traditional kind of select the correct response multiple choice item. So we have different kinds of items. Uh, many of these items will be new item types for students. We want to make sure that we're presenting those clearly to youngsters in the pilot test. So we're researching uh, different ways of presentation and so forth and so on. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. So we are asking two kinds of questions uh, with the pilot test. There are technical questions and there are operational questions. So let me give you a sense of some of the technical questions. Again. The pilot test is testing the test, not testing the kids. Uh, there's this question of what we refer to as scaling in, uh, in, in measurement. So, for example, uh, the English language art test will have reading uh, scores and will have writing scores. Are the scores similar enough? Do they behave in a way that we could use and report them on the same scale to describe student performance? Or would we need two separate scales uh, to provide um, uh, to provide information about them, and here you could think of an uh, analogy for reading might be height, and an analogy for writing might be weight. And uh, height and weight do tend to travel together, particularly with youngsters. As youngsters get taller, they tend to get heavier. Um, and are they sufficiently the same that we could combine them onto something like a height weight scale? Or are they unique enough that we really need to think about height and weight as two different dimensions that are scaled separately and we uh, need to take that into consideration as we build our assessment? Another question is bias. Uh, do the items assess the knowledge of the Common Core instead of something about the student by virtue of group membership or background uh, that is irrelevant to the Common Core but does drive how students perform? Uh, do uh, are the items, uh, do the items draw upon previous knowledge unrelated to Common Core uh, by region of the country, for example? Uh, it, it, perhaps youngsters in the Pacific Northwest know a little bit more about timber and lumber uh, than do uh, youngsters uh, in Kansas. Uh, perhaps students in Kansas know a little bit more about wheat than, uh, than do students in the Pacific Northwest. So we need to be careful about these things. And sometimes uh, biasing features arrive uh, in the test and reveal themselves in the test that even with the best of considerations we're not aware of as we're designing items. And finally, do we have the necessary kinds of tools and supports on the test to make sure that everybody has access to it? Um, and this in, in particular includes students uh, with disabilities and English language learners, uh, but also just accessibility in general with regard to the, uh, the test working on all kinds of devices. Does it work equally well on a, a Macintosh machine as it does on an Intel-based machine? Uh, does it work uh, equally well with on a tablet as it does on a, uh, on a laptop and so forth and so on? So those are the technical questions that the pilot will help us with. Let's turn to some of the operational questions. Uh, to what degree uh, does this uh, technology work in the schools? It's kind of related to that uh, the former question about access, but this is really much more operational when we say that uh, you can deliver our test with such and such number of computers using such and such a bandwidth, does that actually happen? Uh, are our directions clear so that uh, when folks administer the assessment, they administer it uh, correctly and clearly and don't make mistakes? We'll be asking for feedback on the quality of our directions and the clarity of them. And finally, what kinds of service do we need to provide states and, uh, and what kinds of supports do we need to provide states so they can do a better job? We'll include those then in the field test in the spring of 14 and then finally, of course, in the operational in the spring of 15. Uh, next slide, I think we can pause here and take another pause, Ryan. Uh, but let's go to the next slide first. Um. Joe, I, I yeah. had a quick question back on, on cost before we uh, walked away from that. Okay. Uh, the $26 figure um, that, you've, that you guys put out in the proposal and, and what you're suggesting that they work off of uh, currently, to what extent is that um, 
a combination of district and state uh, resources around assessment, or is that just um, the state resources for the assessment uh, operation? And uh, what sort of components, if, for instance, let's play this out and say a state can't get to the $26 a student, um, that they just the, they don't have enough money set aside for it, um, they can maybe do $22 a student. What's the, um, you know, different levels, of, are there different levels of service, I guess is a, a one question, and, and if so, what does that look like? Okay, good. Um, so, uh, to the first part of the question with regard to is this a state or is it a split between district and state, um, great question. And uh, um, right now, uh, there's a couple of research studies out there. One of them has already been published. One is, I think, about to be published. Um, the first from Brookings, the second, uh, I think, from uh, Stanford, taking a look at actual costs right now uh, of assessment programs. They have uh, really pretty much dialed in on the same number, and that is, on average, um, states are spending about $35 per student on assessments. But both, in both instances, those take into account both, excuse me, uh, both the costs that drive from the state office and costs that drive from school districts for the kinds of assessments that school districts are buying off the shelf, um, like uh, like those that are provided by various contractors uh, who have as primary customer school districts. Uh, Smarter Balanced will be uh, providing an assessment system uh, that includes not only the summative assessment, the end of year accountability uh, uh, assessment that's required by the federal government uh, and for federal accountability reporting purposes. We'll also, we will also be providing the kind of interim assessments that these uh, locally purchased uh, products typically provide. Um, now, that is um, that we are costing, we are breaking out the cost separately on that. So that of the 26 or so dollars, about 750 of that is for those interim. So really, the base system, if you want to purchase nothing other than just what is absolutely required for federal accountability, is a little bit less than uh, 20 dollars per student. Uh, and so um, uh, it, the costs do split uh, in that fashion. Again, those dollars are from the uh, 2010 estimate. We're getting those re-estimated right now. Um, and we think we have not changed the design much, so we think we're still pretty close, but it would be nice to get a, a firmer number for folks. So uh, I, I guess it's a multi-part response, and I'm sorry it's a little bit more confusing than um, uh, you know, than just a simple yes or no answer. But uh, right now, um, states are spending a lot more than uh, just the average of about $25 per student on assessments. Um, and but that extra cost is typically borne by locals. And I am sensitive to the fact that it, extre it is extremely difficult for state offices, for governor's offices, and state education agencies to tell local school districts, oh, by the way, that $10 a student you're spending right now on testing, we'll give that back to the state so the state can buy its own test. Um, mm -hmm. That's a scenario that typically doesn't happen. <laughs> um, but, it, uh, but it would, uh, it were the state to adopt the full uh, um, uh, assessment system offered by Smarter Balanced, which would include these interim assessments that can occur during the year, uh, that are not used for accountability, but are used for tracking student progress throughout the year. Um, if the state were to acquire those, uh, that would result in a net savings to local school districts that could then be used for such things as professional development activities on implementing the Common Core uh, or for other kinds of instructional activities at the locals that they're now having to carve out to buy assessment systems. Joe, this That's is Jackie. I would just note, too, that um, we are hearing from our states preliminary planning on what they're going to purchase. And um, many of them are planning to purchase the whole 
the whole package. For example, California has done a comprehensive plan for assessment, um, not just English and math, but in all the subjects they assess. And they have stated that their plan is to, is to use the formative and interim as well as the summative assessment. That's Thanks, very Jackie. helpful. Um, we have a couple of slides here on sustainability. Then we have, I think, three slides, if my memory serves me right, on um, uh, on technology. And then we're uh, that's that's the the, rest, the end of the show, so to speak. So we're pretty much on track. We have uh, it's about 20 minutes left. So I think we're really in in good time, Brian, to address these two questions of sustainability and technology, and also still have a few minutes left for questions in general. Perfect. Yeah. Ryan, can I ask um, one question? Of course. All right. All right. So, hey, Joe, this is Richard Lane at NGA. Um, before you jump off the, the dollar conversation, I know a number of states are trying to figure out this transition period of going from their existing test to the new test, and I'm assuming you guys are giving a lot of thought about how states need to think about the transition from one test to another in terms of not just cost, but also kind of the reporting issue. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any, have you written anything or quick answer that then there could be some follow-up on that states think through that transition point in 2015? Well, we, um, first of all, it's not uncommon for states to have adopted new learning standards for students and then for new assessments to come along aligned to those new standards. Now, that has not necessarily happened in every state, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's not unusual, let me say. Um, and typically, when that happens, states um, in the single year of the transition um, uh, are expected to perform something that's called a what's called a bridge study. The bridge study is um, uh, having a few students participate not only in the new assessment, but take a few items from the old assessment so that a, a, essentially a, a, a scoring bridge can be built. And you can say, well, I know the kids this year are now taking Smarter Balance, but you know if they'd taken that old test last year, here's how we would have done as a state. And you can kind of get a sense of what the, you know, kind of uh, what the, uh, the the difference is in performance from one year to the next. We are uh, act in active conversation with the U.S. Department of Education to be lenient on that requirement. Um, these new assessments will be, you know, brand new, aligned to the Common Core, and so forth and so on. And we're, uh, we are trying to convince the department that what really makes the most sense might be just a hard stop on existing accountability systems and then, uh, you know, jump to the new assessment. If a state would like to do a bridge study on its own, we would certainly um, help them with that and, and not feel that that's something they cannot do. I mean, they can certainly do that, but we are uh, seeking um, some um, uh, help from the department for states uh, to be more lenient with regard to this uh, this transition year uh, because it is going to be um, a, a pretty big shift uh, in many instances from current accountability systems over to the uh, over to the new accountability system. Uh, this notion of not doing a bridge uh, is uh, quite frankly. Uh, uh, we often see it, uh, for example, every time NAEP changes their assessment framework, uh, they do ask the question, are we, should we stay with the same scale or should we go with a new scale, should there just be a break? Uh, sometimes the new, new assessment frameworks are similar enough that they stay with the old scale. Sometimes they are uh, different enough that they just say, okay, uh, time to break trend and, and go, with, uh, go with a new direction. So we're in conversation with the department about that. If states have a particular perspective, um, and as we talk to states, their perspective typically is, uh, let's just do a do-over with this accountability system and, and not try to, uh, not try to, you know, monkey with some sort of adjustment to to get our old scale onto the smarter balance scale. Um, uh, please let us know what your perspective is so that we can represent you well as we uh, converse with the department. But that's the why you probably haven't seen anything in writing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
just going to say, the other element that we've been talking to the states about is preparing their communication plans for what in many, many states, not all, but in many states, will be a, a marked change in the proportion of students who test at what we typically refer to as the proficient level. Um, if we think about uh, where the, the – if we use NAEP as a rough benchmark, um, we, don't, we won't set our standards um, for another year. We don't know exactly where we'll come out, but NAEP is probably the best proxy that we have right now. If you think about what your current proficiency rates are, are in your state on your current exam and what your proficiency rates look like on NAEP, that's a, a good benchmark for thinking about what the change could be as the state transitions to Smarter Balanced. And we already have a few states that have transitioned to uh, college and career ready assessments. Um, it, some of those states have managed the communication um, really well, and it was sort of a non-event when the scores came out because people were prepared for it um, in the local communities and in the business community and in the legislature, et cetera. Um, and then unfortunately, there are examples of states that, that perhaps weren't as well prepared, and they had quite a bit of, of political blowback um, when the new scores came out. So that's another element of this that we're talking to our states about and, and clearly something that um, I would imagine governor's offices would want to be attending to as well um, as, you, as you think about the transition. So let me pick up the sustainability. We have two slides here on sustainability. Um, I, uh, this is something that has been a, um, uh, an ongoing uh, concern uh, of the consortium since we first got started. Uh, the consortium uh, both consortia, both PARC and Smarter Balance, are supported uh, with a grant uh, from the Department of Education that is raised to the top money, which means it's recovery money. Um, and that means that it has a hard stop September 30, 2014. Um, any unspent resources uh, as of September 30, 2014, revert to the Treasury. This, this grant cannot have a, um, a, an extension period. Uh, and uh, essentially all, all supported resources end on September 30, 2014. So we do have a sustainability challenge in front of us as to how, do, how, does, how does Smarter Balanced exist to support states in its first year of operation and continuing on beyond that first year. So we established a task force uh, of representatives from our member states uh, to look into this. Uh, uh, NGA and CCSSO were also very forward-thinking uh, with regard to the sustainability issue and secured some grant dollars that afforded the opportunity for both Park and Smarter Balance to engage with McKinsey and Company uh, to help us build, a, build out a business plan um, for sustainability. Uh, we have been doing that uh, working and working with McKinsey uh, since the uh, end of last calendar year. Um, and we're also working with Assessment uh, Solutions Group, which is the independent contractor to come up with uh, operating costs um, and projected state costs uh, as we go operational. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are taking a look, a very close look at something we refer to as an affiliation model. Uh, this would have Smarter Balance affiliate itself with a university system um, and uh, that would essentially provide the core services for Smarter Balance, the bricks and mortar uh, necessary, the, the back end of, uh, you know, HR and uh, legal and accounting and so forth and so on that Smarter Balance is going to need to continue to operate, uh, and also as a hosting uh, entity to host the, um, the core staff within Smarter Balance necessary to keep the uh, operations um, viable. Member states uh, convene uh, on uh, March 19, uh, 19th through the 22nd, um, and at that meeting, uh, all of our chiefs and all of our higher ed leads and all of our K-12 leads uh, will be in, Mar in Washington, D.C. Uh, for a meeting where we will be proposing uh, a, uh, a motion uh, to the governing board of our uh, of our chiefs uh, to vote on the next steps with regard to sustainability 
um, asking them to approve a model that we've been working on uh, with McKinsey. Um, and once we establish a, a partner entity, we'll then uh, start getting the lawyers engaged and uh, make sure that this is all going to uh, work and, and work smoothly and so forth and so on. The end goal in mind here really is to have a smooth transition out of the federal grant and a smooth takeoff into sustainability so that really the the handoff is not like uh, at you know 11:55 p.m. September 30, 2014, we turn around and say, well, who's going to who's going to turn off the lights here? Uh, but we will have thought about those things well enough in advance uh, that we can uh, we can have a seamless transition uh, in better support of our member states. Uh, the last couple of slides uh, focus on technology, and uh, Kate, let's go to the next one. Um, we have established minimum technology um, uh, requirements. Uh, we want to make sure that schools can use, essentially can use older equipment to give our test than they would like to use if they're using that equipment for instruction. For example, if you're using computer equipment for instruction right now, you probably are asking your students to search the Internet. And in doing so, you don't want to tell them to uh, hit the uh, return button and then wait 10 seconds while the Internet images all load on the screen. That can be very frustrating for kids. They lose attention and so forth and so on. So instructionally, you want your students to have pretty up-to-date equipment. We are deliberately designing oh, the assessment. Bill Kim, so the, the bill. I'm sorry? Okay. That's got some noise there. We're deliberately designing this assessment so that it uses very, uh, very small file sizes um, and, uh, with regard to the items so that you can use older equipment and thinner bandwidth than you probably want for optimal instruction. Um, and that's so that we can make sure that as many schools and districts as possible are ready to go online in 14-15. Uh, we also are uh, eliminating the cost of ownership by releasing uh, our software that delivers the assessment into open source, uh, into the open source community, uh, which means it will be freely available for anybody to use. Any state can use it, and also a state can adopt it if they choose to use our delivery system uh, for delivering, say, their own uh, science assessments or their own social studies assessments or whatever other uh, assessments states may, uh, may have. Uh, that is, it's free and open, and there's no licensing restrictions with regard to using it. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have uh, developed a, uh, a technology framework. It's available there, and so when you get a copy of this slide, I don't expect you to, you know, memorize that uh, that link, but you can find it. Um, and we are keeping our states uh, engaged with regard to the time frames for advance notice about uh, uh, changes uh, in requirements. One example of that is something called natural user interfaces. And natural user inter, uh, interfaces are, uh, say, scribing devices, uh, ways in which students can write out their answer and we can capture it online. Um, an iPad is a great example of a natural user interface, but the new, um, uh, the new uh, Microsoft machines uh, uh, also, uh, the Surface, also uh, have include a natural, um, natural user interface. We think that this is going to be very important, for example, for assessing students' mathematical reasoning because fourth graders and fifth graders, when they explain a math for how they solve a math problem to you, don't necessarily just explain it in words that they can use a keyboard to explain. They might want to draw an example and maybe, you know, draw a, a number of different diagrams and arrows that point, well, then I did this and, that, and then I thought this and that and so forth and so on. We want to give kids credit for that good thinking, but right now, just using a keyboard, we don't have a way to capture that. Uh, we will be uh, expecting uh, to use this in the future, um, but the future year that we will first uh, implement this has not been declared yet uh, because we do want to give states enough advance warning that they can gear up and be ready for it. And I think we only have one more slide now, okay? And this has to do with technology readiness. Um, 
Park and Smarter Balance partnered uh, on a contract that Smarter Balance issued to Pearson uh, to establish a readiness tool that states can log into. This is a web-based tool. Um, states, districts, and schools can log into this tool and tell us how many machines they have, of what type, and what kind of bandwidth they have. Um, and whether or not this information makes sense for states and districts truly does depend on the extent to which schools participate. So we need to get all of our schools participating in this online survey. It is open all the time, and schools can go in at any time uh, to the readiness tool. The output from the readiness tool uh, as of the middle of January um, is comparing your current technology with our minimum requirements so you get a sense of where your gap is. Um, and so it's becoming a more and more useful tool as we move forward. Uh, and again, we encourage uh, schools uh, to, uh, uh, to use, this, uh, use the tool and make sure it's up to date with regard to the equipment that are in schools uh, so, that, uh, so that you and we uh, know what the situation is across our consortium. Uh, the Department of Education uh, have personnel in every one of our member states with regard to the readiness and uh, the governor's offices are encouraged to um, connect with the, um, uh, the Smarter Balance lead uh, individual uh, in each of your departments of education to see where, uh, where your state is with that. I believe that's my last slide. Um, and uh, so we have a few minutes, I think, Ryan, for a couple of questions. Sure. And uh, I know, Tammy, uh, you had a question around public reporting and the speed at which that gets done. Um, are you on the line still? Yes. Oh, so this is Tammy from Hawaii. I had a question about the, the timing of the reporting, so let's uh, the results. And well, let me just put it in context to say that, you know, we're looking at this is an assessment that's going to happen in a window at the end of the school, towards the end of the school year. And we're looking at whether or not the results are going to be able to be available and analyzed and included in teachers' year-end evaluation ratings? Sure. Uh, great question, and one and it is one that we often do get. Um, and uh, our proposal uh, is set, uh, set for ourselves a target of results being returned within two weeks of, um, of completion of the assessment within a, uh, a school or a district or state. Um, they, uh, because so much of the test is online, much of the results are scored instantaneously. Um, there are hand scoring. There is hand scoring that is uh, entailed uh, in the assessment, um, and so basically the turnaround time has to do with the amount of the assessment that has to be hand scored. Right now, uh, we're looking at um, I don't know on the order of. Uh, 20 to 30 percent of the total assessment being hand scored, um, and of course that occurs across the, the span of time of the window. So the results for a school, uh, elementary school in Hawaii, will have to wait until the last student completes at that school. But then two weeks from that point in time, we hope to have results in your hands. So, so does that imply that if for some reason we wanted to hit a, a, a certain date that we would potentially be able to have control the, t the calendar so that we ended earlier than the testing window so that we could get results sooner? Yes, that's exactly what that implies. And so we're working, uh, we are working towards, um, uh, towards providing that level of service to our state. Thank you. So I think what you're saying is our window, you might choose to close your window two weeks before the last day of school and just say, okay, in Hawaii, uh, our testing window closes two weeks before the end of the school year uh, so that then by the last day of the school year, you hope to have your reports in your hands. Um, actually, the reality, I mean, this is a little bit not an FBAC issue, but for I, I, other people who would be interested is that you know, it would have to be sooner than two weeks before the end of school because we're all, we, at least right now, we'd be obligated to produce our teacher evaluation rating that includes the assessment scores by basically the last day of school. 
So we yeah. would actually need right. there, there's right. a yeah, little window of time between the test results and being able to produce a rating, teacher evaluation right. rating. Exactly. And it does and it does that does vary state to state. Uh, I I know the state that I happen to live in, uh, I think there's like a May fifteen deadline uh for renewing contracts. So that would that would kind of put a cramp on 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 that w within this state but uh and it so it does vary from state to state so what we'll need to do is work with work with you all in hawaii and with other states to see what your needs are and to see the extent to which we can we can meet those needs other questions if not joe i have one as well okay um so Part of the conversation, uh, at least maybe in D.C., a lot has been around uh, the potential impending score drops that may uh, happen in 2015 and, and if we are to look at NAEP as, a, as an indicator of, of where scores are going. Um, all of that push right now is around kind of the preparation for the 2014-2015 school year. I'm wondering mm -hmm. to what extent um, will the field test results be released uh, publicly or whether those will be just internal for Smarter Balance and, and whether those could be a good indicator or could be a good, um, uh, good point of information uh, to use as kind of messaging and preparation for the, uh, the changes in scores? Sure. So uh, after the field test in um, 2014, in the spring of 2014, we will score all of those items. We will uh, do the technical work on the items to make sure that the items that are not performing correctly and are misbehaving and are for whatever bizarre reason are not included in the bank and, and so forth and so on. We then uh, conduct something that we refer to as standard setting, which is actually determining the cut scores. So we will know what the scores are on the, in the Smarter Balance system um, across, the, across the entire consortium. We will not necessarily know on a state-by-state -state basis, but we will know at a consortium-wide level uh, about how many students are in level four, about how many in level three, and so forth and so on, um, late in the summer of 2014. So we will, ha we will have as a consortium an advanced look at what kind of what across the consortium uh, the, um, the the shape of the the shape of the next year's results looks like it will give us then a full year give each of our member states a full year uh, to think about and uh, to prepare for what their own state results will be in the spring of 15. Um, so the communications uh, uh, infrastructure that we need to build uh, around that is extremely important um, and we uh, as we get into our uh, standard setting activities uh, the notion of how we are going to communicate this uh, quote assessment cliff unquote um, is uh, is something that we do want to take a careful look at and make sure that we use the information that we have to our advantage uh, with regard to uh, uh, preparation for people uh, for the upcoming year and uh, kind of message this as, okay, this is what's really going on in, um, uh, in achievement uh, in our schools and let's, uh, let's start from here and get better kind of a thing. Um, and uh, so we will have an advanced look at that, Mark. This is Tammy again. So on that, what, that issue, are you going to be able to give some kind of um, correlation with NAEP so that we can start to have a sense of what it means for our state? Uh, yes, we will. Uh, we intend to be including some NAEP items uh, in our field test in the spring of 14. Um, and we're also working with PISA uh, to see if we can't get some PISA items in there so we get some international benchmarking as well. And I do know that Hawaii has already included a NAEP and PISA uh, items in their uh, standard setting procedures that they've used with their current assessment. Uh, so you get that international sense as well. So this is something that you're already experienced with and that we do intend to do uh, similar work. But I guess my, my question is, if the field, I guess what I'm hearing you say is that the field test, which will give us sort of a consortium-wide look at scores, will 
because it'll also give us some PISA and and make correlations or you know comparisons. We can start to prepare locally as well. Yes. Yes, okay. I think so. I think so. Yes. And, and on the communication issue about the cliff, and you know, I know we talked about communicating about it. How much is SPAC planning to do versus how much are you just giving us fair warning that governor's offices and states need to really prepare for that? Uh, I think this is going. This is clearly going to be something where we will be working in partnership with you. So we're not going to leave you out in the cold on this one. Uh, and we will have some uh, certain uh, number of talking points that we want to make sure that uh, that we share with you, uh, so that that is a kind of a common message across the consortium with regard to this. Um, I will add that uh, that Park, as it stands right now, Park will not. Uh, be able to have this kind of communication for a full year, so they will not be able to have uh, this uh, this advanced look that Smarter Balance is going to have because Park is currently not scheduled to do their standard setting until a year later. Um, so we will be uh, out on the uh, out on the leading edge on this, and I think we can take advantage of that. And uh, you know, with regard to uh, this is um, this is important and meaningful work, and we want to know as much. Uh, in advance about it as you possibly can. And Joe, let me just add, this is Richard Lane. So NGA will also provide some help, Tammy, on this one because we think there's significant value both for the organization and, and the collection of governors to be able to talk through this one uh, and provide some cover for individual governors because the drop will happen uh, pretty much in, in most all states. And, and Ryan will send out a chart we've created that just shows what the potential drop is. And so we're working to elevate this up uh, over the next two years in terms of conversations with governors, as well as doing some of the additional work with governor's offices to help them think about how to build the coalition so that governors are not the only ones standing up there when the drop happens, but they're in partnership with business and higher ed and K-12 and parents so that uh, people accept the high standards and they hold to them. Richard, some of us I hope said. that this, some of us uh, hope, Richard, that this ends up being like the Y2K situation because it actually with good preparation and good communications and good strategies, this can be a non, it can be a non-issue. And we have examples of that already. Kentucky did a great job. Uh, recently, uh, with regard to their recalibration, a few years ago, Tennessee did a great job when they recalibrated their scores. Uh, so, it, it, so with good communication uh, strategies, uh, this can actually be uh, work to our advantage rather than uh, rather than be a, a detriment uh, to education. Um, so, we look forward to that support, Richard. Thanks a lot. I know a handful of you have to run. Um, I want to give a chance for any final questions uh, for Joe or Jackie or others or statements uh, before we close out. All right, well, thank you again all for participating. Like I mentioned be, uh, earlier, this is something that we would like to do on a more re uh, regular basis, so maybe on a quarterly basis. Uh, so that we can just make sure that uh, governor's folks are engaged on uh, how the assessment consortia is moving forward and, and the assessment consortia uh, continues to hear from governors about the issues they care about. Uh, so with Great. that, we're going to end the we webinar. Would love, we would love that, Brian, so please call us anytime. Uh, great. Thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you all for participating. And, uh, again, feel free to follow up uh, with me or anyone else at NGA if you have other questions, and I'll send out the PowerPoint as well as the chart that Richard mentioned uh, shortly. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.